Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about obtaining and retaining employment for people in recovery. Joining us in our panel today are David Burns, Director, District of Columbia, Department of Human Services, Washington, D.C. Dr. Gary Bond, Professor of Psychiatry, Dartmouth Psychiatric Research Center, Lebanon, New Hampshire. Peggy Burns, EAP Counselor, Employee Assistance Program, University of Maryland Medical System, Baltimore City, Maryland. Nellie Vasquez Rowland, President, A Safe Haven, Chicago, Illinois. Of those individuals that are unemployed, there was about a 15.7% rate of drug dependency among them. Of the ones that are employed uh, with a drug dependency, uh, there were 23.3 million people overall, and about 49.8% of them were employed. And from the mental health community, uh, there were 6 million people who were served by mental health authorities across the nation, and roughly 21% or about uh, of the 6 million were employed. What does that tell us? What types of challenges, David, uh, do these individuals present as they approach the employment marketplace? Well, that's telling me that uh, actually most people that are uh, that are served by my agency, which uh, provides welfare or TANF uh, services or homeless services, do not have mental health or substance abuse problems. They're, uh, uh, but uh, the percentage is a lot higher uh, than the general population. So uh, probably 20% of the people that we're serving in TANF uh, have uh, substance abuse problems and a similar type uh, uh, for uh, the homeless programs, but when they have both substance abuse and poverty issues, their problems are much, much higher and really need a much more concentrated effort. Yeah, for them to get help. And uh, Nelly, for, for individuals who are dealing with substance use disorder, let's take them first. Um, what do they present as they come into the marketplace? The underlying issue of drug and alcohol addiction is the underlying issue. The real barriers to employment are some of the criminal justice backgrounds that people have um, established along the way uh, that prevent them from getting a job. Uh, their financial history, the fact that they may be homeless and don't have a base to operate from, the fact that they might have children in tow. Um, and, you know, education can be a barrier if you, you know, there's a very high likelihood of uh, drug and alcohol addiction, the failure to complete a formal education. So uh, the barriers uh, basically just go on and on with the underlying issue being drug and alcohol addiction. So what we do at our program is at A Safe Haven is that we find out why people are in crisis, if it's chronic or if it's for the first time. And if it is a drug and alcohol problem that's keeping them from the workforce, let's solve that first and then let's move them through a continuum of care that's gonna be unique to their specific challenges so that we can really pave the way so once they do get employed they're going to be retained and they're going to be successful uh, and that's I think at the end of the day what all employers want. And Gary th does this change much for those who have mental health problems? Well I think the uh, situation for people with severe mental illness and by that I'm referring to schizophrenia bipolar disorder but it includes a wide range of psychiatric disorders uh, that their challenges certainly overlap with um, the, uh, the two populations that, that Dave and Nellie just mentioned. Um, and oh, about half of them have substance abuse problems uh, of this uh, severe mentally ill group. Um, uh, the, uh, the challenges is that, that they have are, are not what you might expect. The first thing that pops into people's heads might be, or often is, that they have uh, psychiatric symptoms that prevent them from working. And that turns out not to be the biggest barrier. Uh, there are a range of things that really interfere with, with uh, uh, their getting into employment. They want to work. The majority of them want to work. Our statistics suggest over two-thirds want to work, even though, mm -hmm. as you indicated earlier, a very small percentage 
maybe as, less, as little as 10% in some of our surveys uh, are actually working at a given time. Uh, th there's a big gap there, and, and the reasons, uh, the barriers include um, uh, the lack of encouragement and help from the um, uh, mental health community, from mental health professionals. And uh, certainly we think of stigma as another big barrier that um, uh, uh, the public and uh, employers may have misconceptions about how violent people are that, with mental illness, even though you know, they are, uh, you know, the, uh, the findings are way blown out of proportion by, you know, by the media. Um, and uh, uh, another huge barrier is fear of losing benefits, okay? Uh, uh, folks with severe mental illness are living on the edge, they're living in great poverty, and um, they don't want to lose their um, health care benefits and uh, other benefits that... So let's go a little bit into that. That would mean that an individual is getting a, a specialized consideration on their X programs, and if they became employed, they're afraid of losing those benefits? That, that's the number one reason that people with severe mental illness don't look for work. Um, and often it's based on misconceptions. So a, a big piece of this, which we'll get to later, is uh, how to intervene and how to give people accurate information about mm -hmm. what really are their benefits and what are the consequences if they go back to work. But I go back to the first point, and that is the importance of hope and uh, optimism on the part of the individual who's looking for work, having that belief that they can succeed that is um, supported by mm -hmm. the folks around them, that it, that's so terribly critical. And Peggy, we've talked about substance use disorders, we have talked about mental health problems. What other, are, uh, let's take a look at your work with, uh, within the EAP realm. What other presenting issues uh, have you faced uh, you know, as an EAP counselor? I work for a medical system and with medical professionals as well as uh, everyone that's employed by the system. Um, what often happens is uh, we have uh, nurses, doctors who um, have an issue with substance problems and then they're in a position where it's very easy to divert. Um, then if they get caught, and they usually do, they'll come uh, via employee health uh, where they get a um, evaluation and then the employee health sends them to EAP. We assess the situation, evaluate, and then send them to a um, outpatient treatment center for further evaluation and then follow with those recommendations as to whether or not they're going to be sent to an inpatient facility or outpatient. In most cases it starts out with outpatient because of the different insurance companies that are out there uh, are not ready, willing, or able to want to put someone in a 30-day uh, program or an inpatient program. So which, which avenues, I know you've, you're talking a little bit about what one does once one identifies the problem that actually mm -hmm. comes in, but in terms of the challenges that, are, that come before you, um, are, do they come because there's individuals within the workplace that notice that someone is not really oh. uh, working up to par and then they bring them in, or do they come because of a, 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 a boss or a supervisor may have um, a concern? All of that, the above. All of the above. Plus, they also self-refer. Rarely, but they do. Um, so usually what happens is the manager or the supervisor will send them for a fitness for duty if their obser observation is that they're not functioning. Um, oftentimes, they miss days, Mondays and Fridays particularly. Um, and when they are on the job, there may be some physical impairment that can be observed. Um, I recently had a case where a, uh, an RN was sent to me because she was falling asleep on the job, which is, of course, highly unusual. And as the uh, situation evolved, it turned out that she had a very serious problem with a prescription medication. So um, they come from all different angles. There's no specific way. And you yourself have an experience because you, you're a person in recovery. That's you want exactly to talk a right. little bit about your own experience. Yes, I, uh, I've been in recovery for a little over 33 years. Um, I was 34 years old when I came into recovery. And uh, when I came into recovery, at that time I was not employed outside the home. Uh, I was at home taking care of my children. 
And this is a disease, and the disease continued to progress. It's also a family disease. Um, I come from a family where it's not only um, uh, runs in the family, it gallops in my family, <laughs> both sides, all the way around. Uh, I didn't recognize that I had a disease called alcoholism until I went into um, an AA meeting right off the street, and that's how I got sober. And you were employed at the time? I was not. I was employed. Well, I was, but not outside the home. Okay. I was employed in the home. Um, but as the years went on and I got involved in this field, uh, I began doing a lot of work with women who were employed and who had um, issues, barriers to even um, looking to get treatment, seeking treatment because of taking care of their children, um, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, this is a question for the entire panel. Let's talk a little bit about why employment is such a critical factor in, in recovery. Uh, David, we'll start with you. Okay. And of course, I work with uh, unemployed people. That's my, uh, my focus, people who are uh, in shelters or uh, receiving welfare benefits. When we find out that they uh, have substance abuse issues, uh, then we find that the substance abuse is uh, a barrier to the employment, but the, uh, a lack of employment is a barrier to their recovery. So a lot of times you don't start out with just getting somebody a job, but the, uh, actually the first thing we find is getting them into safe and stable housing because they can't be successful with a job and they can't be successful with treatment until they have so a place. So it's an issue of housing first. It is a, an issue of housing first, but then uh, the job that you, they often need is often just a part-time job just to get them stabilized, get them a little extra money, give them some hope, the, some sense of uh, self-esteem, and it gives them the resources then to maybe be able to take a class or two uh, uh, that uh, will prepare them for a career. So it's get a job, get a better job, get a career, and at the same time, addressing all of their barriers, whether they're mental health or uh, substance abuse. And when we come back, we'll be able to continue with the rest of the panel and get their views. We'll be right back. The perspective when a person in recovery is seeking employment um, is sometimes difficult. People are sometimes concerned about whether they should be um, forthcoming uh, with where they are in the process. Lots of times they will have breaks in employment that they'll need to explain. Um, I think generally speaking, being honest and forthright about the situation and being proud about being in recovery and where they are. and. Um, and what they need to move forward and the Im importance of the role of employment and the fact, frankly, that they've overcome the issues they've been struggling with, I think is a very important and positive thing to say when you're seeking a job. And frankly, the more people who are willing to say they're in recovery and the more people who are willing to say they've had these histories, I think is better for everyone. When we are talking about the importance of employment and some of the complexities associated with getting a job, there is a, another alternative, and that alternative is to volunteer. What volunteering does, uh, similar to a recovery job, it allows that person to uh, offer service, to get to be known, to uh, provide uh, uh, some skills, depending upon what skill set they bring to the situation, uh, to demonstrate reliability, to be able to show that they can be accountable, and, and to acquire uh, personal references that uh, can be of use to others in the community. I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here. And then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had and the most important. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
you do not have to be in recovery to be an effective counselor. I want to make that clear. However, the fact that I am in recovery and have I've been counseling for over 30 years, it helps me because when I share and self-disclose with people who are sitting there filled with shame and guilt and remorse, uh, and they don't understand that they're sick and that they have a disease, when I share with them that I've walked that walk, I've walked in their shoes, I know what it's like, and I know that you can walk through it. Um, they really listen, they really pay attention because they look at me and say, if she could do it, I can do it. So Gary, let's continue. Um, is employment a critical factor in the whole schema of, of recovery? Uh, we say in, in the mental health field that work is a, the key to recovery. And building what, what Dave said about substance abuse, many of the same themes you'll see there in terms of of, of, of giving people a sense of self-worth, uh, a sense of direction. Uh, what are you going to do when you get up in the morning? Uh, you know, uh, work really structures people's lives. It, uh, it's in a normal adult role. It, it gives uh, great meaning to people's lives. And uh, as we hear the stories of people who have recovered from mental illness or in, the, uh, in recovery from mental illness, almost invariably, one of the key ingredients is that they have uh, found a way to find meaningful activity. Uh, and most often, that means competitive employment. And so uh, we believe that uh, supported employment, which is a program to help people get employment, is the best therapy around. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, and actually, the research shows it's the most effective of any of the psychosocial interventions, any of the things that we do, and more effective, actually, than medications. And I'm not saying that we don't need medications, but if you look at the single ingredient that makes the biggest difference, it's helping people find their niche and, and, um, in, the, in the workplace. That's one key ingredient to, uh, uh, you know, a meaningful life. I want to come back to that supported in, uh, employment because I want to really look at the all the components of that. And Nellie, when individuals come into your uh, uh, center for assistance, what what do they uh, really ask for? You know, in terms of do they primarily want to be retrained, or do they do they basically say just try and get me a job first? What is their initial? contact? Well, the initial contact is really uh, to get them a job. And uh, what's different about uh, a safe haven, and I agree with both of you, and it really was uh, great to hear, you know, that housing is a, is a critical piece. You know, you cannot begin the process of even looking or having a job uh, without having a place to live. And uh, I do. Well, I can imagine someone filling out an application and says, you know, <laughs> exactly. where, what is the address? And there's no address. Exactly. I, mean, and I, I suspect, though, that some might put a, a temporary housing for, you know, in terms of a halfway house or right. some other type of, of residence, but that is a residence. Exactly. And I agree with Gary that, you know, work is definitely a critical piece. However, where I disagree with both of them is that it's part of the process. You know, what we do at A Safe Haven is as people come to us and say, we hear you get people jobs, uh, we do. But we assess the individual situation and we tell people at A Safe Haven, here you have an opportunity to reinvent yourself. Let's find out why you're in the position that you're in. Is it chronic or is it for the first time? Uh, is there uh, education barriers? Is there drug and alcohol involved? Let's solve those uh, pieces first and then let's move you to the next steps. Uh, so for an individual, for example, a woman coming out of the prison system that has been in and out of the prison system for years or you know, maybe for the first time, uh, and her children are in the DCFS system, a job would be nice, but first we've got to get her in a position to be stabilized, uh, to be reunited with her children, and in our program, can be reunited with her children and then take on the responsibility of possibly taking on a job and you know taking the next step forward. So it really is uh, individualized. You now people are not one dimensional. You know, and, and a job isn't a solution for everybody. Uh, at the end goal is you know to get people a job. The end goal is to get people permanent housing. But uh, for each individual, the path to getting there uh, is different. 
you know, and that's what we do, is we look at the individual situation. And by doing that, we literally uh, achieve very high retention rates for people coming through our programs. Just to give you an example, we've had a three-year contract with the Department of Labor uh, for job placement and retention, and our three-year retention rate has been about 85 percent. Very impressive. And what's great about that particular uh, statistic is that that's been with ex-offenders. Very good. Gary? If I could respond to a couple points that Nellie made, I certainly agree that uh, services need to be individualized, and you need to look at the whole person, mm -hmm. and you need to look at housing, and you need to look at the family situation. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but in our uh, supported employment model, uh, the model that's been adopted around the world, I might add, um, we have looked at uh, the timing of employment, mm -hmm. and this is counterintuitive. Many people wouldn't think this would be true, but we have uh, a, a score of studies that show that uh, when a person says, I'd like to go to work, that you help them then. You do what's called a rapid job search approach. You don't wait until they stabilize. Um, uh, but you move ahead and looking for that search and that employment can be part of the recovery process for people with dual disorders, with mental illness and substance abuse. That is, that their uh, improvements and changes often come in the employment area before you see uh, abstinence and some of the other important changes in their lives. I think the trajectory for each individual is very different. But the key thing that I'm saying here is that you don't go to somebody with schizophrenia who um, is, you know, struggling with um, a myriad of problems mm -hmm. and say, well, listen, you have to go to day treatment for a while until we get you stabilized. You don't say that. The evidence is very, very clear that you're better off listening to what the person says they want and working around that, building the program individualized. Uh, making some sensible decisions about housing and, and medications and other things as well. That's all terribly important. And the mental health clinicians need to work closely with the employment people. So uh, that part is, I think, similar to what you're saying. But the key thing that I want to say is that we do not uh, 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 delay uh, the search for employment uh, based on any notion that we know best. There is no evidence that clinicians know when somebody is ready for employment. No evidence. It's been studied for 50 years. No evidence whatsoever. If someone's a substance abuser and they're still drinking and you find them a job or assist them to get a job, what impact does that have on them being able to keep the job? I mean, I would think it would be a setup to fail almost in a substance abusing case. If I went and got hired for a job and then I couldn't get there or I was missing time, um, well, how we think about it is we're certainly not opposed to people getting uh, good help for their substance use. Uh, sure. uh, that is part of, the, of the, the whole package, the whole deal. So that, th that certainly is not what, what I'm saying at all. But um, in looking for a job, very much you depend on the natural consequences of uh, passing the drug screens and, and, and uh, you're making yeah. some sen yeah, sensible decisions. I was decisions. just going to say, Gary, yeah. because there are some, uh, I mean, certainly SAMHSA has the workplace program where people are tested while they're in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Employers can avail themselves of these services, and um, they provide not only help with uh, assessing employees, but they also certify the labs, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a point where in any job placement program, an individual has to be told, of course, you know, we will help you look for a job, but there's some prerequisites in terms of what you will be facing as you enter that workforce. Mm -hmm. Correct, uh, Peggy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. perfect yeah. sense. Well, when we come back, what I'd like to do is really we already have the dynamics of, of the timing of when someone ought to look for a job and, and some of the conditions, pre-existing conditions that need to be in place. Um, but there's also an aspect of some of the barriers that they will face as they go into that workplace. And that's what we're going to deal with when we come back. We'll be right back. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. 
And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. every morning to take the A, the B, or the C train to come down here, you can turn that to getting paid. We have a lot of families that are living well, well below the poverty line. And I believe that if we are able to give people jobs um, that they enjoy doing and they want to go to every day, they'll go, they'll succeed, and hopefully they'll be able to make the money that they need to provide for their families. And what happens is when families are able to provide for their children, you're helping someone to create self-esteem. You're helping someone to become more motivated. So you want to be able to focus and being positive at all times, all times. Okay, never let that circle in front of you be negative. You always got to be positive. For somebody in recovery, you need to feel like you're someone. Like this place is called We Care. I care now. You get people that care, you start caring. And when you start caring, it, it transposes to everything else in your life. We Care stands for Wellness, Comprehensive Assessment, Rehabilitation, and Employment. It's a program under the Human Resources Administration of New York City, and it serves approximately 50,000 public assistance recipients each year, those who have indicated that they have some medical or mental barrier which prevents them from re-engaging in the workforce. Public assistance is meant to be temporary. It's not meant to be something that is long-term and lifetime. You know, so we're hoping that as our clients come into our program, they recognize the need and the urgency to want to do better. We work with our clients to provide job placements. Um, we work with them to get their GED, to help them get their resumes together, and we work with them to find the jobs that are suitable for them. Whatever their skills are, we use their skills and look at their limitations and help them to apply for those specific jobs that are suitable for them. Our mission is about respect and care, and it's about making sure that all individuals become the best person that they can be, being able to become self-sufficient. When a customer first comes into the WeCare program, they go through a comprehensive, what's called a biopsychosocial assessment. So all aspects of their medical and their mental health and their social environment are assessed to understand what are the key barriers preventing them from re-engaging the workforce so that we can understand their entire health picture holistically. Half of these skills that you have in front of you right now is so important that some of us don't even realize it that how listening skills is so important to us. Individuals with mental health and substance abuse have many challenges. The most important one that they encounter is generally that society tends to be very judgmental and stereotypical and think that people with mental health or substance use can't be productive members of society or that they can't work. Well, I chase this life now probably even more so than I did my drugs, you know, because I want it. I really want it. I want it just as bad as I wanted that heroin and that crack. I want this life just as bad. So now what I want you to do, I want you to type in, I am learning Microsoft Word 2000. I hope to learn at least one new thing in this training session. Now, the only thing I knew about a typewriter or a computer was ASDF, JKL semicolon. I'm typing, in some cases, 20 words a minute and not looking at the keyboard. People in recover from mental health and substance abuse, they really are an asset. And the asset is that you're getting someone who's gonna be very committed. And the reason is because they've been through a trying time in their lives. Just because we're recovering addicts doesn't mean that we don't wanna work. We're recovering addicts that wanna work. You know, we wanna be a productive member to society. Whether it took us 35 years to do it, it really doesn't matter. But if somebody's going to give me the opportunity to go out there and be productive, then let me do it. 
You know, don't judge me because of my past. You know, it's not who I was, it's who I am. You will probably find that those clients are much more long-lasting in those employment because they have owned something. They have something that they call their own. They feel that they are a value to themselves. They feel that they're a value to their family and to the community on the whole. My goal is to be a substance abuse counselor because what better job could I, could I get? Not that I say I can't work in some corporate place or be a porter or stuff, you know, whatever. But I mean, you know, how, why could I not give away what I have? You know, I live the life. While the impact of the WeCare program is significant in itself, we place over 2,000 people per year directly into employment, we can't forget the larger economic benefit that the program has for the city. Those 2,000 people are trusted employees of local businesses. Those local businesses and those employees are returning tax dollars into the local economy. So when you're serving uh, 50,000 people a year, when you're placing 2,000 people a year, that has a significant economic impact on our local communities. Where do you see yourself in a year from now? What would you say, class? Working. 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 So, David, we're, we've talked a little bit about what are some of the challenges for people coming in. Talk to us about what is working. What programs do you currently have that basically uh, provide great opportunities for individuals who may have had a problem uh, and, and are now in, in recovery? That's a great question. And the first thing we discovered was that we didn't even know who had the problems before. So the first element is to do a much better assessment, screening, and to find out uh, who has the problems. The second is we have moved away from the continuum of approaches where you start out with treatment, you go to uh, some education, to having much more of an array of approaches. So a person might start out with a part-time job at the same time they're in substance abuse uh, treatment and going to some counseling uh, of, uh, for mental health issues and dealing with family uh, problems all simultaneously. And in order to do that, the uh, third element of the approach is everybody seems to have, our, for our clients, about a half dozen or more case managers. And so I said when I first came to this job, uh, if they already have a case manager, that's good enough for us. And, uh, and we will deputize other case managers in the city to be our TANF or our homeless case manager as long as they can uh, c continue to help the people along the road, both to recovery and to self-sufficiency, and they can tap directly into our services and supports so that they can uh, have help with housing, have help with uh, education, have help with uh, uh, getting a job, but maybe they're bringing their expertise from substance abuse or mental health. And the, uh, the final element is the the family or the individual chooses who their primary case manager is going to be, and then we all support both that family and that primary case manager. Excellent. And Peggy, in, in terms of you see the whole realm of it, mm -hmm. you were just saying uh, earlier during the break that you deal not only with the individual but with the family, and what things are the most successful in your view uh, in terms of retention of good employees because, um, uh, you know, yeah. as, as, as we were noting before, individuals that are in recovery uh, or individuals that have a problem that need to go to treatment mm -hmm. are individuals that are, I suspect, very valuable to Absolutely. the, to the uh, employer. Absolutely. And what, what I think is the most important is that they develop support networks. Um, um, both with the 12-step programs as well as um, as an EAP counselor and the fact that I am in recovery adds a little bit more um, that type of support to continually help them to be able to move forward. Um, University of Maryland Medical System in the last couple of years worked with the Helping Up Mission in Baltimore and, and a few other agencies and um, they had some service positions available and they um, had these uh, whoever wanted to apply, apply for these service positions, and they hired about 40 men. And when the men came, um, they had to be monitored and followed up by EAP. And what we found was it was an exhilarating experience for the EAP counselors because we don't normally deal with that population. 
And what we found ourselves doing was helping them in every area that you can imagine. And I mean, I had a, a young man who I helped to work on the computer. Um, I helped another one to get a sponsor to get involved in 12-step uh, fellowships. Um, and they really did succeed. Of, of the 40 plus that were hired, I don't have the exact numbers, but I believe that there's over 35 that are still employed. What's important about that is the ones that stayed and are still employed and still sober are the ones that stayed in residence with the Helping Up mission during that particular time. Very good. Uh, Nellie, let's talk a little bit about partnerships. And I know in, in Chicago, talk to us a little bit about the types of partnerships that you've been able to build with the business community to be able to get them to understand the value of hiring someone in, in recovery. Oh, partnerships are a huge piece of what we do. Um, we are very uh, engaged with uh, various chambers, you know, throughout the Chicagoland area, uh, whether it's the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, whether it's the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I mean, you name it, we're involved with them and they're involved with us. And uh, the great news is we are a huge resource for them, essentially a staffing center at this point. You know, we have um, been learned to be trusted you know, so that as great people are graduating from our programs, uh, if they're getting a referral from us, they know that this person's not only been successful in the building the right type of foundation and getting the life skills and, you know, the job training and the things that they need to be successful, uh, but they also know how to follow through and execute on the job for an employer. They become a very productive employee, uh, just firsthand, you know, to tell you a safe haven as is an employer of many of our graduates. You know, we have about 100 80 employees and I want to say at least 50% of our employees are graduates of our programs. So we have a very uh, intense uh, professional development uh, training program. So we train people that have gone through the system, that have expressed an interest and they have the propensity to help others. Uh, we help them, you know, to get the certifications that they need to grow with us. And um, that's really important in terms of being able to get the street credibility with the residents that are coming through our programs to see that, you know, not only is our program uh, successful for, you know, our graduates in terms of having literally turned into a job that they see someone, you know, working day to day that's successful, uh, but also it's an inspiration, you know, and it's a role model and it's a mentoring opportunity for us to offer the residents that come through our program. So I can tell you that we have a very high retention rate uh, of our own employees and uh, employers in the community have grown to trust us. Very good. Gary, mm -hmm. how do you work with, in partnership with some of the folks that are uh, sensitive and, and uh, want to hire uh, individuals who, with a mental uh, health problem? Well, maybe that the best way to explain this is to describe evidence-based supported employment, which is the, uh, the approach that that we've been studying for uh, and disseminating for the last 20 years, uh, a, a network of us uh, at Dartmouth and uh, around the country and actually around the world now. Um, so uh, uh, evidence-based supported employment is an approach that has been um, uh, uh, endorsed by SAMHSA. In fact, a lot of the early studies were done uh, through SAMHSA funding, uh, but now there have been 16 rigorous studies, randomized controlled trials, the, the gold standard in uh, drug research, um, 16 studies uh, of this evidence-based supported employment, and every single one of them has shown an advantage to uh, supported employment and helping people get competitive jobs compared to other approaches, traditional approaches that include stepwise approaches that involve counseling and transitional employment and other things. Uh, so. Overall, the employment rate from these studies is about 65% um, for people who enroll in evidence-based supported employment compared to about 23% in comparison groups. The 23% is pretty close to the rate that you mentioned earlier for people who receive no services at all. Uh, we have a couple long-term studies. We need more long-term studies, but what is really exciting is that uh, in these two long-term studies, 10 years after they enrolled in this supported employment program, over half of the people who initially enrolled were uh, study workers, which means they were working about half the time during their 10-year period. So, um, so tell me a little bit about what happens to 
a, a potential employee that goes into a place that believes in supported employment. Okay. What happens exactly to them? They go in, do they get trained? Do they get um, special follow-up? What happens? The approach is based on uh, eight principles. Um, they include uh, one that I've already mentioned, what we call rapid job search. So we don't have a lot of preparatory work before people go out looking for a job if they say they want to work. And that's the second principle here, which is that the only uh, criterion for being in a supported employment program, aside from being a client with severe mental illness, is that you say that you want to work. We don't have any screening criteria because none of these predict whether somebody can work anyway. And uh, the uh, uh, objective of this program is competitive employment. That is getting a job that anybody can hold in the regular workforce and in integrated settings. We're very in interested in people working alongside people without disabilities because so much of their lives often is uh, you know, embedded with uh, ghettos of people that share their condition. Uh, we work very closely with the treatment teams. That's another core principle. Um, and then there is a principle of job development, which gets to the point of how do you interact with the employers. It's a matter of individual choice. So if a, a person wants to disclose that they have a mental illness, you, you will work It'll with... It'll be their choice to disclose. It, that's correct. And uh, you will work with the employer to try to explain, you know, who you represent um, and uh, why this person would be good for your position. Uh, so uh, another principle is that of, of uh, client preferences for jobs. We try to find jobs for people that, uh, you know, suit what their interests are, what their strengths are. If they have an, uh, a drinking problem, we probably would not advise them to work in a bar, for example. Um, and uh, then long-term follow-along, we know that's another key ingredient to stay with them over the long term. I mentioned earlier about benefits planning, or I alluded to it. That's another key ingredient to talk to people. What does it mean to your Social Security if you go to work? So anyway, this model has now been disseminated. We have a, what's called a learning collaborative in 14 states in the District of Columbia. Well, when we come back, I want to touch on some of the issues uh, that will help us to place more people, and that's dealing with the stigma associated with both mental health problems and addiction issues, and we'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others, I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join the Voices for Recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. NADAC, how can I help you? NADAC is a membership association. It's made up of persons who focus on addiction services, whether that's uh, counseling, training, education, research. Our mission is to advocate for the addiction profession, to educate and train. The training is on conflict resolution and relapse prevention. NADAC works with SAMHSA on a variety of workforce development projects and initiatives that help to bring people into this profession. So that would indicate what? That my, I'm not making the best decisions. You can't watch all the bases at once. And it's very nice to have a resource organization that does. Here's a vital, valid profession you can sink your teeth into, and it's going to pay off. The benefits to join NADAC as an individual member is that you have the opportunity to grow as a professional. NADAC provides a variety of services. Training is one of those hot spots that we provide. Counselors need to have ongoing education, 
training specific to the new drugs that are coming out and the new evidence-based practices. So if you're a student currently enrolled in a program, you can qualify for the student membership. We do also have online courses, webinars, that each month that a person can access. And for our members, those webinars are free. For those non-members, it's really offered at an extremely low discount. I haven't listened to her. I haven't figured out what is, what is it is it going to help her to feel comfortable and loved and part of this connected relationship. And then advocacy is one of those other really important things because our clients often can't be their own voice. We as the professionals become their voice. What would be your response if I said it to you like that? Give me my drugs. Give me my money. Okay. And so I love engaging with our volunteers, with our membership, with our certificates that we work with, because I see the effort being made by them. How bad was it? We have listened to the profession in order for us to be able to offer what people need, not just what we presume that they need, but we've also looked at what is out there in terms of new evidence-based practices. In this new age of uh, electronic technology, we're going to see more and more need for electronic health records. HIT systems are going to be a godsend for our profession. Being able to share that, that demographic information and treatment plans and progress notes is going to be very important to help that person move quicker in their recovery and get more comprehensive recovery. If a recovering person can find employment early on in their recovery, it lends self-value. It helps a person's self-image to feel gainfully employed. I like to tell employers when I do employer training that the thing about people in recovery is that you know what their issue is. You don't have to guess. I believe it's very important to the person in recovery for a sense of self-responsibility and human dignity and for the employer and seeing that he's, he has a workforce that's largely untapped that's willing to work and will be loyal to the employer. The reason why I got into this profession is because of my family history. In my own recovery, I started uh, using before the age of 10 and had a lot of medical issues as a result of early use. This profession literally has saved my life. I would not be still in recovery today. I would not be alive today if I had not put myself into this uh, profession. If I'm talking with a person initially, I'll let slip enough for them to figure out that I've been there, done that. But after that, real treatment has to come in. And the real treatment is what pays off. Treatment is effective, and that recovery is possible, and that their life can change completely from what they knew when they were in the middle of their addiction or their mental illness. And now they can have a whole different life the rest of their life. Let's take a look at now the, the governmental structures that um, are, are, are necessary to get uh, some of these uh, issues dealt with. In the city of, of Washington, D.C., for example, have there been special policies that have been presented related to this that foster a better understanding of the issue and that deal with uh, a higher degree of participation from employers? Are they incentives? Because I know that within SAMHSA, the recovery support initiatives, which is one of the strategic initiatives of our agency, is taking a look at indeed uh, not only housing, as you were mentioning, housing first, but in addition to that, they're taking a look at workplace to see and identify what kind of incentives can be made in order to encourage more people to hire. Yeah. We work with a variety of programs, our Department of Employment Services and uh, vocational rehabilitation uh, programs. Uh, substance abuse treatment programs. So we don't do a lot of the direct placement or, or dealing with the stigma, but trusting and partnering with the other agencies to work with the families. I think a big change is just having a sense of hope. And we have to get rid of our own stigma first before <laughs> the client can get That's rid of it. Point. So uh, if a client wants to disclose, then uh, we help them with the, the messaging. If they don't, then we help them try to figure out a way to uh, keep it as confidential as they can. 
uh, but it's all individualized and it's all working towards that own, uh, one person's uh, best way and approach to overcoming both the stigma, the barriers, and most importantly, building on their own strengths. And Nellie, have you had experience in terms of attempting to get your municipality or the state to um, develop uh, initiatives? Uh, for employment, specifically for people in recovery, for mm -hmm. example? Mm -hmm. uh, no. No, we haven't, uh, but I think that the political and economic realities are forcing, you know, everyone to rethink, you know, uh, our approach. I think the stigma associated with the issues of drug and alcohol addiction has really been, um, you know, well, endemic. It's discrimination. It is discrimination. It's been endemic because of the way we've <coughs> institutionalized this issue with the criminal justice system or the drug court system, you know, the things like that, as opposed to dealing with it as, you know, uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, as a disease, you know, and uh, people do uh, successfully uh, recover. They uh, live very successful, productive lives in recovery. And, you know, just going back to our own issue in terms of when my family went through it, my husband went through it, and we had the idea of starting a safe haven, and my husband had been in recovery, it was a concern personally for ourselves. Do we disclose? Do we not disclose? And uh, it was my decision, and I asked my husband to please consider because it was something that, you know, was very personal to him, uh, and it had to be his decision. And I said, you know what, we just need to own it, and we need to wear it like a badge of honor. Absolutely. Because truly, this is uh, something that we went through, we got through, and we came out on the on the right side and others can too so I think that and as it's more part and more of all people that accepting responsibility exactly and I think and as more people that are successful and there's lots of them you know um, like Peggy you know come out and are willing to talk about it I think that you know they inspire others and at some at some point employers will value that you know as something that they want to see in their employees someone that's maybe overcome something and now has you know uh, not doesn't have these issues because when you're hiring someone you don't know whether mm -hmm. they do or they don't and well I think I think one of the things um, that I want to clarify is that the, the drug courts mental health courts they are looking at addiction as a disease and I think that goes a long way to getting the broader society mm -hmm. to be more accepting and to say you know if our criminal justice system is recognizing that individuals who come through the, the drug courts or mm -hmm. special family drug courts or now they're even considering having youth uh, drug mm -hmm. courts, mm -hmm. uh, mental health courts, you know, where individuals, judges are, are knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the dynamics of what goes on with the individual, what goes on with the families. I think they're uh, definitely uh, I, an arm of this field in I, gaining uh, a better understanding within the community. And I love that that's happening uh, and that we're starting to consider the idea of a diversion program and no entry program for people that do suffer from this disease. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to see is the funding follow the treatment and support services that are necessary. Gary, you want to add something? Uh, I just wanted to add a point about uh, the underfunding. Uh, uh, SAMHSA reports that only 2% of people with severe mental illness actually have access to evidence-based supported employment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the mismatch between what we fund uh, and uh, what is effective. What we know from some of our research is that in the long term, people who work use the mental health system less. Mm -hmm. And so the savings, the cost savings, can be phenomenal over the long term. One area which we really haven't talked about a little bit uh, is, is individuals in recovery starting their own businesses. And I know you mentioned your husband is in recovery. Yes. And you want to talk about how he got into business? Well, um... Yes, he's in recovery, and um, fortunately for us, it wasn't out of necessity that we created our business of, you know, a safe haven. It was out of a desire to help others that may be suffering from something uh, that he went through but didn't have the resources uh, to get the help that they need. Uh, so we decided as a charitable thing to just open up, you know, a recovery home. We became the first licensed recovery home in the state of Illinois, and the rest is history. Today we have over 22 locations. We see over 4,000 people a year. Uh, the vast majority of people do get reconnected to their families, to jobs, and to permanent housing. And um, what has also happened, as we have seen uh, people face barriers to employment, we have created what we call social business enterprises. So we have businesses that are the intention is to create is to create jobs. 
for people that are graduating from our program. So therefore, we overlook the background checks. We already know they have a background, and they're, but they've proven to us that they are you know, worthy of an opportunity. So we employ them within our own businesses. So we have a landscaping company, a culinary arts catering service, a pest control company, a housekeeping company, a customer service and sales training company. So uh, that is something that's been um, basically an outgrowth of our success. Thank, Thank you. you, Gary. Final thoughts. Well, I just want to reinforce the theme that all of us have been uh, noting, the importance of work as really the centerpiece of the recovery process. Uh, I think we can all agree on that. And, uh, you know, there are um, daunting challenges, but I think there are ways around, and we've, we've heard some uh, pretty encouraging um, case examples. David. I like to uh, think about uh, a theory of abundance, that even though there's not enough money around, a lot of us because we're getting such poor outcomes, and that if we see our roles as prevention, even my agency is preventing deeper end services, uh, everybody uh, sees where their clients are coming from and where they're going to, and if we uh, keep people from getting deeper into the problems and support the systems that keep them out of uh, even our own programs, the good outcomes will be much cheaper than the bad outcomes we currently have. Very good. Peggy. In my position as an employee assistance counselor, um, I work with several people who are working on developing better feelings about themselves so that they can sustain their, their job and feel <coughs> really good. And in terms of debunking the stigma, I have a little expression that I'd like to share that, that really helped me a lot when I first came into recovery. And that is that um, we are sick people who can get well. We are not bad people who have to get good. As sick people, we sometimes do bad things. It doesn't make us bad people. And I've said that a million times to many, many, many of my clients who are substance abusers, and that has really made a difference. So. And I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. And as such, we want to encourage all of our listeners to conduct events, get together with their community coalitions, community organizations to plan activities during this month so that we can continue to make headway into the not only the area of employment, but continue to get the millions of people who need help, the help they need so they can get into recovery from mental illness or addiction. Thank you for being here. It was a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.